I'm Intelligence Specialist, Senior Chief Charles Zim. I'm in the Reserves. I've been in the Reserves 18 years. My job is Information Warfare Coordinator, and I'm also the E-Talent Department Leading Chief Petty Officer. I'm Petty Officer Hargrove. I'm a Fire Controlman, and I joined the Navy eight years ago uh, from Indiana. And I joined because I have two kids, and I wanted to give them a better life. Um, so I did that by joining and becoming a fire controlman. I went to school for about two years prior to going to um, an aircraft carrier. I attended three schools with different training levels and ultimately I became a SeaWiz technician, which is a weapon system. Um, we also worked with torpedoes and missiles and I served on the USS Theodore Roosevelt. I did three tours or three deployments. I did an around the world deployment, a deployment to the Persian Gulf, and then I did the deployment that the ship contracted Corona. So one of the benefits about my job specifically being a SeaWiz technician is that I did a lot of electronic work and training in the technology field. And then I also did a lot of mechanical work and we do a lot of wrench turning and just like down there getting dirty. In Intel school, I remember when we talked about the sea was we called it the R2D juice. Absolutely. Hi, I'm Petty Officer Gruber. I'm a nuclear electrician's mate. Uh, I joined the Navy approximately eight years ago out of uh, the Bronx, New York. I was 17 years old when I joined, so my parents had to sign my contract for me. Um, but they were pretty excited because both my parents are high school science teachers, so this is something that they love. Um, I went to school for two years in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I learned everything from nuclear physics to reactor theory, um, all different types of schools. By the end of the training, I got certified by the Department of Energy for my training in nuclear reactors. Um, after school, I went to um, Norfolk, Virginia, was stationed on CVN-69 USS Dwight D. Eisenhower. It's an aircraft carrier. And I only did one deployment because our ship was in the shipyard for a long time, unfortunately. Um, but I got to go to Italy, which was really cool because my family lives there. So I got to hang out with them on my first deployment in the Navy. Uh, we went to Bahrain, Dubai, France, and um, we had a really good time on it. Um, but what I did personally on the ship was everything from electrical power distribution, creating electrical power, and maintaining the electrical safety system for the nuclear reactor. Did you ever have your parents as your teachers? Uh, I did. Uh, so I went to high school where um, my dad teached, and my dad was my physics teacher in junior year of high school, and then was my AP physics teacher in senior year of high school. So he's pretty proud of me because most of the stuff that I learned in the school, I learned from my dad like so, two uh -huh. years prior. So. so he could take credit for Yeah, it. <laughs> he could take credit for, for my success, I guess. Was yeah. he harder on you in class? or? He was. He was way harder on me, but it like turned out okay because I got a four in the AP, and nice. after that, like I was, when he sent me off, he was like, "Oh, I'm done. My job is done." Uh -huh. I succeeded <laughs> as a parent. So pulling into Italy, it was pretty choppy. So when we, the aircraft carrier can't pull into port, right? So they have to be um, out, further out into the ocean, and then you have to take a small boat in. Um, and there actually was an earthquake that hit. <laughs> Can I show you talking about this? Yeah, what year, what year was this? Um, this was in 2016. Um, earthquake, uh, not an earth, well yeah, because Mount Vesuvius is still an active volcano. Mm -hmm. So there's always small little earthquakes that mm -hmm. happen in Naples, Italy. And um, they, there was a little earthquake and people kind of leave the ship, sadly, but I fortunately got to. Um, and then I got to hang out with all my uh, grandma's sisters and their kids and everything. My grandma was one of 13 kids, so the entire family still lives there. Oh. Yeah, so that was pretty exciting. It was my first port call in the Navy. I got to hang out with my entire family. Oh, so, that's awesome. Yeah, it was really, really cool. Legend has it, the pizza's from Napoli. Yes, oh, it was so good. Yeah. <laughs> it was delicious. <laughs> all right, bring us home. All right, well, good morning, everyone. <clears throat> I'm Fire Control Technician, but also first class Paul Gaviria. Uh, I'm in the Navy 12 years now. Well, actually, the next week will be exactly 12. Um, first half of my career was spent in uh, Groton, Connecticut. That's where I had my FTA school. 
And also I did a few months in Newport, Rhode Island for additional training for specific systems for my combat system. And then uh, the rest of my career was in Pearl Harbor, uh, Hawaii. That was my second submarine. So my first submarine was USS Pittsburgh. Mm -hmm. It's a Los Angeles class submarine. And the second boat was the USS Columbia, mm -hmm. also a Los Angeles class submarine. Mm -hmm. And uh, with those deployments I've done, uh, I've been to uh, Yukon, so most of Europe. I've uh, been to MED, I did a MED run, and also did a, a CENTCOM deployment. And then on the Columbia, I did just one deployment, because after that, we went straight into the shipyard for two years. I did a Westpac, so I did Japan, Guam, Philippines, Singapore, things like that. It was really good. So I practically been around the world and never thought I would do that. Right, so, but aside of uh, traveling, which is one of my favorite things, uh, my job in, in, the, in as an FT is I'm in charge of a million dollar computer system that consistently updates every couple of years. So I have to keep training myself and my junior sailors to stay on top of that. Right, we go to schools. That's that's the technical aspect. The other aspect is the on the job. Right, you just you have to troubleshoot. Right, whether it's the software or it's the hardware. Right, something breaks. If it's like legacy old system that's made by the military, okay, there's like certain books and certain uh, companies you have to call and they'll you get the part. If it's cots like commercial over the uh, over the shelf, that's a little it gets a little harder. You have to learn how to like work with what you got, work with the same parts, and then make it work. Whether it's like, you know, how would I say this without jerry rig it, if you will, <laughs> you know what I mean, right? But and then if it's a software thing, you have, if you can't do it yourself, that's fine. That's why you have support. You call a squadron. You call like a government contract to come in and learn from them. Kind of like, hey, how do I do this? I don't have to call you again, right? And then in my career, I've seen a lot of people be FT and leave to better pastures, like you know, to Grumman, Progeny, uh, uh, Lockheed Martin. Those are like big companies. Everyone that kind of makes those uh, computer systems. And I was like, for me, that's something I'm already on track. A cheap bag of and I've been in the Navy for about 18 years now. Um, I joined out of college actually. I was going to college to become an electrical engineering major. And then halfway through it, I had a friend that joined the Navy. And when I accompanied her to the recruiting station, they gave me the test just to see how I would do. I was kind of curious. And I tested really well and they started talking about this program. So this program being a nuclear program, which is uh, for power production, energy production. And I thought, wow, that sounds actually really interesting. So instead of just doing electrical engineering by itself, I could tack on the nuclear side of it and get into actual like, energy plants. So I thought that was a pretty neat way to uh, kind of go in the same direction, but change it up a little bit. So I got to do a full year and a half of training to become a nuclear operator. And I've been on three different aircraft carriers from the Nimitz in San Diego to the George H.W. Bush in in Virginia. I got to be there when it was built, so watch it come to life from the ground up. And then I got to go across the pier to another ship called the Carl Vinson and ride it around South America, which was pretty awesome because I got to go around the Horn, which is a pretty rocky area of the water, and I got to see penguins off the coast of Antarctica, so that was pretty cool. <laughs> and uh, I really just enjoyed my time. I've, I, I've loved what I do. I always said I was going to just do it for a couple more extra, couple extra years, and next thing I know, I've here I am 18 years later. So, loving what I do, working with nuclear reactors and, and monitoring all the parameters for power plants and just, uh, just loving the fact that I'm working in a science field that I've always been interested in. For all the people that are interested in STEM, in science, technology, engineering, math, why don't you take us through a day in your training, whether it's in your A school, which is a school right after uh, boot camp, or your C school, which is your advanced training, or on the job training. So just talk a little bit about what you were taught nine months of training and every day it was always learning something new. You touched a little bit on electrical theory, a little bit about wire wire rates, a little bit on uh, uh, maintenance aspects, so 3M, right? And then a little bit on the operation of it. You only get a touch of it because you're going to do a lot of it OJT on your ship. So that, that nine months went by quick for me. More of my training is uh, on, the, on the job, right? As soon as you get to your ship, uh, you get a you don't get you get a specific system you know like I could go a little bit on well actually my first submarine was the oldest uh, fire control system was uh, CCS Mark One it's no longer used but it was essentially green screen for those of you might understand that it was a bunch of knobs old um, 
basically, you know, taking information and what we used to call stacking dots. And that's just one little aspect of my job. The other aspect when I'm not on watch is, hey, go do maintenance on said component. And most of my stuff is in, it's called CSCS, uh, Combat System Electronics Space, which is the forward end of the submarine. Right? I know my stuff is in there. In the, yeah, <laughs> it's all you guys. So, and then other, the other aspect is also in the torpedo room. And so I own all that stuff down there. So it's either the weapon launch console, all that is computer service now. And my job is to not only just test them, but to operate them and consistently make sure they're running, just like any IT pro would. The Sun Nuclear uh, Training School was approximately two years long. It's in Charleston, South Carolina. Our E school, uh, we learn everything from basic electricity, Ohm's Law, to digital theory, to how basic equipment works, DC versus AC current. Um, and then our next school was power school. Um, we learned everything from nuclear physics to reactor theory, chemistry, materials used in the nuclear, like on a nuclear reactor. And then our last school was prototype, which is probably the most fun school. Um, it is a old submarine that's converted into a training platform uh, where you can learn how to properly um, control electrical, sorry, uh, nuclear power and the reactor so you can basically um, and how to stand watch properly without, you know, kind of getting just thrown to the wolves on, you know, on an aircraft carrier or something. So by the end of that school, you get certified by the Department of Energy, and then you go to your, you know, your ship, so either an aircraft carrier or submarine, to do the job that you did prior. Nice. What was the most fun part about uh, prototype school? Uh, I think it was finally seeing everything that you learned the year and a half prior come to life, right? So everything from how the nuclear reactor makes electricity, like the, all those pieces, because I didn't, you you learn that in a book, right? But you don't you don't see it happening. And you can see like, wow, like that's amazing. Like all of this stuff, what like, works? And um, honestly, that was the coolest part for me. Or just being able to walk around the submarine, like wow, I'm in I'm in charge of all this electrical equipment. Like that's that was cool for me. So. Um, that was probably my favorite part. You also went to nuclear school. Oh, go ahead. No, I got a question. Mm -hmm. uh, during your power school, I know it's pretty long. Yes. Is, is it, it seems to me, it's almost like, it's like a, a college setting. It was. It was definitely like a college setting. Uh, it was from 7 to 4 p.m. Uh, Monday through Friday. We would sit there, learn all of that stuff. And it was, it was not even, we were learning one class at a time. It was different subjects at a time. So while I was learning chemistry, I was also learning, um, so as an electrician, I have to learn about the other nuclear rates, right? So the other nuclear rates are mechanics. So they work with the water systems for an air, um, sorry, for a nuclear reactor. Um, so I learned about that while learning about chemistry, while learning about reactor theory and how nuclear power, like how, if that changes, what's gonna change in the plant. So yeah, definitely like a college setting. Would you agree, Chief? Absolutely. I thought that one of the most interesting parts about the pipeline itself, and what they call the school system, was that you were learning all the theory in the classrooms, but you would supplement it with labs where you get to be hands-on with some of the equipment. So you would actually get an opportunity to measure voltage and, and see wavelengths and, and things like that. But then when you got to prototype, like, like she said, you got to see it all come together. And one of the best parts of that for me was seeing when you operate something, watching the gauges move and watching the, the rods that control the, the fission of the reactor, watching that watching that occur as, uh, as you lower and raise them. And so everything, and everybody works together. And it's, it was super impressive to me to see how somebody engineered this massive, complex uh, piece of equipment and how it interlaced with one another. So all these different systems and how they were codependent on one another. And I thought that was a really interesting like part of it. So that's what I liked about it. So everybody that talks to me about the nuclear program asks me, can I still get it if I'm not good at calculus? What would you tell someone? Yes, 100%. Uh, the, all you need for joining the nuclear program specifically is to have never failed an algebra class in high school. Um, and as long as you have that, you'll be good to go. You don't need any, you know, background like I had because of my parents. You don't need college. You don't need anything like that. You just, they'll teach you everything that you need to know in the program. You just have to be interested and have to have the motivation to learn. 
Uh, my training was it started with the same technical I think that we all received, um, where we learned about electricity and got our basic introduction to just how circuit cards work. Um, following that, I attended an A school, which for FCs, for fire controlmen, it just went through training of all the different types of fire controlmen that there are. And at this time, when I attended, it was FCs and FCAs at the Aegis aspect. We also learned some of that also. Um, and then after that schooling is where we picked our job that we would have. And that's where I picked Seawiz Technician, which is a closed-in weapon system. Um, it's a six barrel Gatling gun that does the self-defense of the ship. Um, it does surface shooting and air contact. Um, and for that school, it was about nine months that we had to attend in Virginia. And that broke down the basic troubleshooting of the entire system, uh, which was interesting and I learned a lot. But then the most effective training that I had was on the job training that I did on the ship where we actually learned how to fire the system, how to troubleshoot with the system, how to track, search, everything with the weapon system. So what sure. other um, things could you have chosen to do besides work with SeaWiz? So as a fire controlman, we own all of the weapon systems on ships and so there are different missile systems. There are different missile systems. For example, on the carrier that I was on, I also had training on NATO Sea Sparrow and the rolling airframe missiles. Well, on the job, well, big thing going off the missiles, I mean, with weapon systems, there's not many schools for that. A lot of it is on the job. So like for me, uh, you know, I, I deal with torpedoes and Tomahawk missiles, right? So we're, we're trained in weapon safety, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, all, Everyone in the weapons department has to be not only qualified 3M, but also weapon safety. And that all that is just, here's the book and go. And then at the end, after a certain amount of months, you're gonna sit in front of a board, they're gonna watch you do these things. And, and then it's like, okay, you were qualified or nope, you're not qualified, keep doing it until you do it perfectly. Because you're dealing with bombs and ammunition here. So uh, on the technical aspect, we're testing, not only does the weapon work, you know, like, hey, can you turn it on, turn it off? So our, uh, our torpedoes are called ADCAP, Advanced Capability, they're very smart. And as a fire control technician, I, I can control the weapon where it's going, under the water, to a certain degree. Uh, with the Tomahawks, same thing, up to a certain degree when it's in flight. So, big thing out of that is weapon safety. So it's shipping and unshipping, loading and, un and backhauling, right? So, uh, the, the ultimate thing that uh, as a fire control technician wants to be Qualified, it's called a uh, conventional weapons handling supervisor. That's the big thing. It's like, hey, you are in charge. You're not hands on. You're just making sure your junior sailors and your team leaders and members do, or know what they're doing. And you jump in at the last second before or preventative. Hey, did you check? Did you do all the maintenance? Did you verify all the checks are in place? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And then, then there's no incident. I can't tell you how many times a weapons movement has been delayed because whether the team leader or maybe the team member wasn't doing their job. So our schools actually as an electrician and as an electronics technician, they're very, very, very similar. We think we have like two different classes. Yes. Um, but on the ship, our jobs are vastly different. Um, we just both work with electronics. Whereas mine, I'm working more with wires and the motor controllers, program programmable logic controllers. Um, the 4160 volt switchboards, the 450 volt load centers, all of that stuff. So all the electrical power that goes to all of our safety equipment. Whereas an electronics technician, you're working more with circuit cards and all the stuff that's like controlling the reactor, if I'm correct? Yes. Um, so theirs are more reactor, like reactor, like controller based, whereas ours is the entire reactor power plant based, if that makes sense. Um, so, like for me, I know there is only so much you can learn, like in a book. So, we do everything from like clean specs of these 4160 volt um, circuit breakers, where you just have to rack. Like you can't, you can't learn how to pull out these huge boxes of like 
metal, I guess. I don't know how to explain it really, but um, they're, they're huge, huge circuit breakers and you can't learn in a book how to do that, right? They just, it tells you, but you have to actually do it and you have to put on these huge uh, 40 cal um, arc flash suits and basically look like you know, you're going into, like, you're wearing this huge bomb suit to pull out this huge circuit breaker. You, you don't learn that. You can't learn that in a school. They try to teach it, but it's not, it's not the same. And that, that's like one of the biggest things that we would do as electricians. Um, another thing that they don't teach you about in, in the school is shore power, um, where you have an <laughs> aircraft carrier, right? The electrical power is created from our turbine generators which gets steam from the nuclear reactor, right? But when we're in port, we don't want to operate these nuclear reactors when we're sitting on, you know, alongside a city, right? So we take these huge 4160 volt cables, basically plug in power from like the city of Norfolk, Virginia to the aircraft carrier so the aircraft carrier can have electrical power. And um, doing all of that, you need to have a lot of muscle to pull those cables down from the <laughs> pier all the way up. Um, you have the entire division working together to try to pull those things on, okay. you know, from a submarine. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that because is that just a, well, how big is your division? On um, each, oh, so we have two uh, divisions because we have two power plants mm -hmm. on an aircraft carrier. So you have two plants of approximately 35 people each and then maybe like a few other people out of plan. So you have 35 people pulling up one cable and then having to, you know, we had Boy Scouts, thank God, in, in the Navy. So they, they knew how to work with like um, rope and everything, make sure that the they were secure on board and then plug them in. That was a whole ordeal oh, yeah. pulling in for it, so. Oh yeah, on a summary, it's a all hands evolution. Yeah, oh. Uh, Sometimes the officers <laughs> might get involved, but yeah, I it's wish. all. Yeah, because we have 150 people and half, yes. the, half that is the engineering department, yes. so they need help from the forward compartment. Yep. So hey everybody, let's get all hands, you hear the one I'm seeing, just go down there, show power. Oh, man. <laughs> it takes us about, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes, we do it right. What? Yeah, well, because- On the carrier? That thing is like a hours. four yeah. hour, or maybe oh. five, yeah, every because, time. Well, yeah, because we have one <laughs> reactor, but we have about eight lines to connect. So we had eight lines to connect and I wish it took that quick because that was we were always the first people on board last people off the ship because yep. of that whole mm -hmm. uh evolution and then having to start up the reactor and that whole thing you can talk more about that right yeah so for us um, we we're the first ones on to get everything ready um, the entire reactor department which, which includes not only the electronics technicians the electricians mates but also the machinist mates the directed mechanics and we're all working together to start the start the power plant so in order to start it, you have to do this whole lengthy procedure, which I can't really go too in detail on that, but uh, basically you're going from cold steel where nothing has been running in the power plant, all the way up to the point where you start bringing the reactor online. And so all that process takes several hours. And so usually you're starting the preps for that a full day in advance, trying to get everything ready to go. And, you, and some things even before that. So it is a pretty lengthy process. Um, one thing I could say, well, the electricians mates is there's some, something that you learn in the school is how to to move, move electricity and move the load from one machine to another. So we have all these different types of machines and generators that are that we're using to power the ship. And you can have part of it power this part of the ship and then the other power this part. And you can switch it around so that if you have to take this one down for maintenance, you can now move some of that electrical load to the rest of the ship. And that is a lot of art included with that science as well. So things that you, when you watch an electrician who's sitting in the panel for switch gear operator, you're watching them move the load from one machine to another, and there's definitely some timing involved. There's things that you can't read in a book, you have to do in person. And then for us, our equipment is mostly safety related, um, working with the reactor itself as far as controlling it. And so we're able to watch the reactor come online and come to life. We're the ones that call it when it when it's online and when it's not so it's a pretty awesome experience because you feel like everyone's watching you because they are <laughs> and uh once you bring the reactor online if it, it, it's you can feel the room just kind of get a get, get a little calmer because now like the stress is over you, you you did the hardest part now it's just a matter of keeping it running which is easy 
it's definitely a little nerve-wracking talking about like getting machines online and everything. I was qualified low dispatcher on board, and so like when you'd have to start up the turbine generators or put the um, reactor coolant pumps on a coolant turbine generator before uh, leaving, you know, out, you know, out to sea, like you have the commanding officer, the reactor officer, the like XO behind you, and you're just sitting there like, oh, I hope, I hope my people don't mess this up, because you're you're the one di directing it and leading it, but you have no control over it, and so you're like, oh, I really hope this goes well, <laughs> and you're like, it's so nerve wracking, but you can't like honestly, you can't learn that in the book. You need to have like that finesse and that practice. In your Navy career, I just want to know, how have the young sailors changed at all from when you first joined? Are they more technically savvy now, or are they different? Um, what do you guys think? I, I think that they definitely are a little bit more technically uh, savvy. So I know my aircraft carrier was created and it was commissioned in 1977, right? So you have a lot of old electrical equipment like the motor controllers, but then you also have programmable logic controllers and circuit cars and all that stuff. And when you have younger people joining the Navy, they know more about computers than you know older generation just because they they have computers um, so they're a lot more technically savvy when it comes to working with circuit cards and you know like I know for for my job a lot of people that I worked with like built computers that was like their hobbies mm -hmm. so when they're doing that in the you know in the field on the ship it made it a lot easier for them to know how to you know do the job I completely agree uh, definitely had a uh... ETV first class, uh, he's an electrician, electronics technician for navigation. On his on his time off, when he's not on watch, he was literally just repairing circuit cards and co doing codes. I asked him one day, "What are you doing?" He was, you know, just hanging out in cruise mess with a, a circuit a circuit card, he's fixing it, and then he pulls out his tablet, which was at the time allowed, and he's like, "What are you doing?" "Oh, I'm just beginning to learn how to do code." And he was already like, you know, 12 years in the Navy. I was like, yeah, I'm working on this this certification using Navy Cool, pay this off. I was like, and like that guy, man, he, he was the one who told me. This is my, this is back in 2010. I was just like a FT3 at the time. I didn't know anything. And he explained what Navy Cool is. Like, yeah. He's like, why don't you do that? You're in a tech, right? I was like, all right. So at the end of the deployment, he showed me the website and I looked it up. I was like, oh, I can do all these things. The Navy's going to pay for it? I was like, all right, why not? So. Navy credentialing online. So there's a Absolutely. lot of programs for education, for technical training, to get certifications. There's a lot of opportunities out here in the Navy. How has the Navy prepared you guys for your next career, for your next life? So, anybody, you guys, jump in. Uh, well, I, I grew up in New York City, so I always like fantasize about being FDNY. Like that was just my thing. Um, so in the Navy, they actually have a saying that all sailors are firefighters. Um, and even though I love nuclear power and all the opportunities it gave me. Um, Working in engineering spaces, they actually teach you how to properly dress out, wear SCBAs, put on the firefighting equipment, and fight fires like electrical fires and all that stuff, and how to um, fake out a fire hose and like actually, you know, learn how to be a firefighter. And He's so NFT. yeah, yeah, exactly. So definitely, when I get out of the Navy, I want to use that training, um, hopefully, to be a firefighter and. Um, they gave top-notch training, definitely. How about the rest of you guys? Oh, for me, I'm, I'm already on my way to be uh, going IT pro. You know, with the, with the Navy credentialing opportunities online, Navy Cool. I've already got like A plus. I'm still working. I'm going with C plus, Security plus, Network plus. So those are like the basics to, to become an IT pro, and definitely on that. So I'm uh, very grateful for the Navy. But on top of that, thinking of, uh, being a submariner. I know how to fight fire, know how to fight casualties. It's not just fires. We're talking about like yeah, uh, toxic gas, uh, steam line ruptures, uh, uh, you know, what else, uh, force protection, you know, things like that. So absolutely, right? So those are things that maybe I can, I like to believe I can handle myself under pressure. I think that's the same for me is, I actually came into the Navy with a bachelor's degree in accounting um, and then pursued learning how to troubleshoot and maintain a multi-million dollar weapon system which is completely different from anything i had ever experienced in my life so the navy really just gave me the knowledge that i'm capable of learning and becoming an expert in whatever i choose and so i'm not specifically going to do something with weapon systems when i get out of the navy 
but I'm leaving with the confidence knowing whatever I do pursue, I will be great at. And the one thing I'd like to add for about that as far as the, the skills you learn, is I feel like any of these jobs, any of these STEM type jobs that we have in the Navy are preparing you not only for how to do your job, but they're preparing you how to learn that type of job. Mm -hmm. And so you do get that experience that you can take with you that I feel like when I was going to college first, I did my two years of college before I joined, and this definitely gave me a whole nother like, aspect to that. So now instead of just having the book knowledge, I have all that experience that I can back it up with, and building out a resume is a lot easier when you have on-job training. So mm -hmm. I think that all of, all of these jobs can prepare any one of us to do some great things after the Navy. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Okay, Sorry. <laughs> I was going to say, I think it teaches us a lot of discipline. I know all of us went to really long schools and a lot of grueling, tiring days. And I think that teaches a lot of dis discipline and motivation to, um, you know, do something great. Absolutely. Yeah. But the big thing I learned, at least in the last five or six years, is the Navy is going to train quality people to become quality leaders. Right. My last uh, six years I've been LPO, um, one at a training command and the other one for a submarine. And I have had some really bad days. And if it wasn't for mentors, quality first class and chiefs, right, and even some superstar seconds who kind of like hey, guide me or push me or show, hey, you're not doing that the right way, try this way, All right? And I had to get over myself and to take, take that advice, take it with arms wide open. And then in the end, whether they want to thank you or not, I know that my success was theirs just as well. And I, I have to thank thank you for that. And the LPO is a leading petty officer, so it's a leadership position. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll just throw in, uh, I'm a reservist, so my path was a little bit different. So I was in grad school at San Diego State with my master's in social psychology. The 9-11 terrorist attack happened, so I wanted to try to finish grad school. And there was a reserve career on campus, so I told them I want to go to cool places, I want to do cool things, and I don't want to swap the deck all day. Took the test, went well, he said, hey, how about Intel? So, hey, Intel sounds great. Um, when I was working as a uh, research, uh, uh, researcher at UCSD, University of California, San Diego, I just want to throw in, I was making about 30000 There was an opportunity to go to interrogator school with the Army, because back in 2006, the Army uh, did a lot of interrogations. The Navy was trying to get back into the human intelligence game. So uh, I volunteered, I mobilized, uh, went to training, and then as an E5 with um, San Diego Housing Allowance, I was making about 50000 So it just blew my mind. The Navy, you hear things about, oh, the pay isn't good, the people that go into the military are the people that don't have a college degree, but you had a college degree before you joined. I had a college, I was working on my master's. So there is a lot of misperceptions, misconceptions about the military, and I just want to throw out that Hey, I joined the military, or I, I went on active duty, I made a lot more. I was making 20000 more than as a researcher. It just blew my mind. When I got back to Iraq, I had a lot of job skills and a lot of great experience. I got a contracting job at Guantanamo Bay, Cuba. Great experience there. I learned a lot, but on the off time, uh, you get a small boating license, there's a lot of diving, scuba diving, so that set me up. I got great experience there. Then I got a contracting job in Germany. When I was in Germany, I saw all of Europe. When I was in Asia, uh, Korea, I saw all of Asia. So the military, the Navy is going to set you up. You're going to have great opportunities to travel. And you're going to meet awesome people. There's a lot of opportunities to grow, to develop. And the big thing about the military is other jobs, they want you to have experience and training and knowledge. Here, we're going to give you all the training you need. We just need exactly what you said, just good people. So the Navy, all we really need are people that are morally, physically, and mentally fit. We will provide all the training. Uh, with that said, do you guys have any last comments before we close this up? I just liked your comment on uh, sailors are not poor, because uh, that's definitely true. Yeah. <laughs> uh, our bonus right now for like the nuclear program is $40,000. Uh, and they give me $75,000 tax free to do three extra years in the Navy. And it goes so, higher. Yeah, it and just it keeps going higher. higher. Yeah. They're offering me 100000 uh to stay in again, to go back to a ship. So <laughs> definitely See, definitely don't have an issue with money. Definitely. Yeah, either that or you get a six-figure job when you leave the Navy. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I love it. Those are good options. Yep.
those monetary bonuses, those incentives are to keep people in the Navy. You join the Navy, you get this training, it's hard for the Navy to keep you guys in. Uh, we need you guys out there, and those monetary compensation is to, again, it's incentive to try to keep you guys in, because we put all this money, trained you guys, and we just hope to keep your talents as long as possible. Yeah, they they uh they spend like a half a million dollars on each nuclear um, sailor for their training, so um, they definitely want to get their money's worth. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Absolutely. Yep, you're gonna come away you with this security clearance, training. So there's a lot of things out there, uh, but again, thank you guys so much for your time. We really appreciate it.